Hi everyone, uh, I'm Chris Parsons. Can, can everyone hear me okay? They've put mics here, but I feel like, you know, I can, I can project and we'll all be okay. Um, so these are my contact details. If you've got any questions or there's anything you kind of want more information about, feel free to kind of get in touch. They also appear at the end of the session as well, so if you don't make a note of them now um, or you're kind of reserving judgment until you see what I have to say, that's fine. Um, so I'm here today to talk about large model support. Uh, and this is a, a story that started a long time ago and we've been on a journey as IBM and we've not been doing it alone. And basically our goal has been to enable the next generation of machine learning workloads. Um, but before I begin, can I just profile the room? Who, who in here is actively working with TensorFlow? Like, uses TensorFlow, every, has a good number of hands. Um, other people in the room, developers, that kind of thing, actually writing code or just, cool. Cool, we've got a developer audience. You might have expected that, right? Okay, cool. Um, so what I want to talk about is the, um, the out of memory compute problem, right? That blue screen of death on Windows or that little beach ball on a Mac, but actually how that translates to AI and GPUs and how we've got a really good story and a solution to that problem. And it's enabling some really, really interesting work. So all of this journey begins uh, back in 2011 when IBM built Watson to play Jeopardy. So we built this uh, computer, made a lot of noise about it and beat two human like, grandmasters at Jeopardy. And when we were designing that system and building that system, we really quickly realized that actually we had a problem. And that problem was we were limited by the infrastructure. Right? So when you try and do machine learning at that kind of scale, when you try and solve a problem as complex as that and ingest all of Wikipedia, you run into some problems really quickly. So we used our own hardware platform. We used the power processor architecture, which some of you may know from, from way back when. I think it's like 30 years old now in, in different guises. Uh, it was also in the PS3 and the Xbox 360 as well. Um, and we made this decision uh, a little while ago to only build heavy lifting systems with it, right? To go after enterprise compute, to move out of that, um, that kind of commercial space and start to build these really big systems. And it was that system that we were using to play Jeopardy. We were using to build Watson. Shortly after we built that computer for Watson, uh, we got a phone call. In fact, we got several phone calls um, from Google and Nvidia and Mellanox, the networking guys, and Tyann that build these systems. And they said, hey, IBM, we really like what you're doing here. right? And we think you've got a really good story to tell when it comes to AI. And we want to work with you to design the next generation of systems. So in 2013, so two years after Jeopardy, we did it. We open sourced, well, we opened our processor architecture. And the idea was that we'd create this foundation to innovate and design systems for specific workloads, right? One of those workloads, might have guessed, is AI, machine learning. And we're working with these different partners to collaborate and build systems just to tackle that challenge and to tackle that challenge at serious scale. So uh, we've, we've built a couple of those systems and uh, basically our focus is around GPUs, obviously. Won't come as a surprise to anyone in this room. And it's this fundamental fact, right? It's that deep learning is memory constrained. And as you guys start to work with more complex problems and start to work with larger data sets, actually we're constrained by the amount of memory on a GPU. Right? We're constrained by the amount of space on that processor silicon. So as our models get more complicated and our data sets grow, right, suddenly we can't build AI. We can't continue to build the systems we were building as accurately as we were. So how do we solve that? Well, this is the typical um, scenario that I'm sure we all face today, right? This, um, this purple box represents my GPU memory, which could be 16 or 32 gigabytes in the V100 generation. And as a TensorFlow developer, right, your goal is to put everything in that address space. Right? So you have to fit your input data, you have to fit your uh, neural network, what that network definition looks like. You have to fit all of that on the GPU memory and you have to leave enough room to fit your computer tensors, so your output layers in that address space too. So you have to leave a lot of free space, right? And that's fine when you're working on um, small uh, batch sizes or smaller data sets, but as your problems get more complex, how do you address them, right? So we're quickly seeing this happens. 
So we're working on our problem, we're training our network, and at each layer of this network we're computing the tensor, so there's the first tensor. Some of you will have already seen what's going to happen. Um, that's fine, so we go to the next layer of our network and we think, great, okay, got the tensor for that, and we go to the third layer of the network and suddenly we've run out of memory. Right? This is our blue screen of death moment. Although typically with a GPU you don't get a blue screen of death, just your training fails. Right? You'll probably get some kind of GPU memory effort, error. Um, so how do we solve that problem? Right? How do we build and design systems that can get around that problem? So through that collaboration that started with NVIDIA and through that Open Power Foundation, what we've done is we've fundamentally changed the way our processor architecture works. Right? So we've taken that NVLink technology that lets you tie your GPUs together in, in any environment and we've baked it right into our processor. Right? And that means that our CPU can talk uh, to the GPUs at GPU speeds. Right? So we've alleviated that bottleneck and that lets us do something really, really cool large model support. So uh, this is what we can do. So down here, the slightly pinky box is system memory, right? Which is relatively inexpensive when compared to GPU memory. And there's also a whole bunch more of it, typically like four terabytes of it compared to the 16 or 32 gig that you had of GPU memory, right? So let's go through that same process, but assuming we're using large model support. So at this, every time I compute a tensor, right? What happens is large model support automatically offloads that to system memory. Right? So at each layer, I move it out to system memory, and I can repeat that process, right? Because suddenly I get that 16 or 32 gig back free for the next tensor, for the next image. Uh, so I compute all the tensors, calculate my uh, loss at the far end, and then I can begin to backpropagate, right? So I can update the weights at each layer of that network, calling in that tensor, kind of doing a preemptive fetch, and getting that data back from system memory into the GPU memory at each stage. Uh, and all of this is possible because the GPU and the system memory, because of that NV link on the processor, share an address space. There's like address coherence. So the GPU can directly ask for data in system memory. And similarly, the system can directly access data that's on that GPU memory. Um, there's no kind of difference there. And that lets us take that challenge that we couldn't solve before, right? Take that challenge that was either, you know, too complicated or too large to fit in that GPU memory space, and suddenly we can actually solve it using the current techniques. And there are some really, really cool applications for this that I want to go on to in a minute. But before I do, what does this look like in TensorFlow, right? So we have to make some modifications to your TensorFlow graph to do this. Um, it's not free. Uh, so that is this kind of swap in and swap out phase, right? So the first thing we need to do is have this kind of hook that is part of your TensorFlow graph and tells TensorFlow when it needs to swap data into and out of GPU memory. Now you can do that based on um, chunk size or GPU utilization. So we could say, hey, when the GPU hits 75% utilization, I want you to start offloading stuff to system memory. Or we could say, everything over 4K, I want you to move that out too. Right? So you're making those kind of decisions dynamically and you can threshold them. So you have to make that slight modification. And of course, that's just the phase we need because it's the CPU that's moving the data back out to system memory and vice versa at each step. So that's the modification to the TensorFlow graph. Now, uh, what does this look like in code? I have some code on the next slide, and I'm aware that for some audiences that can make people go to sleep. Others, it'll perk them up again. Um, I'm hoping you're the second category. Um, the guys who are using TensorFlow, are you Keras users or are you native TensorFlow? Keras. Keras users? Mm -hmm. Keras, mainly Keras, good. You guys are my people, that's much easier for me to explain. Um, cool, so uh, this is the code. Appreciate that might be a bit small. There are some screens around if that is a bit small, although I appreciate they're all facing me, so only I can see them. Um, so what we've got here is the code required to implement large model support. The top is the Keras implementation. The bottom is using the TensorFlow native estimator. The fundamental principle is you wrap your solver, so you wrap whatever solver you're using, in these LMS hooks, and then TensorFlow knows, or the Keras API, the TensorFlow, uh, the large model support implementation, knows to offload certain data, right? It knows to offload based on potential GPU utilization or, or whatever it is. So it's knowing to take that tensor, that computer tensor, dump it out to system memory, and it also knows in backprop when you're going to need that data back, right? When you're going to need those weights back to update them during the backpropagation phase. So it's really simple in Keras. We just grab this, uh, so it sits in contrib at the minute, which I'll talk about in a, a bit. 
bit. Uh, so we've got this LMS um, object, and we simply say, hey, when we're filling our generator, we want you to use this LMS callback. Right? So super easy if you're doing things the Keras way. Uh, slightly more complicated natively in TensorFlow, uh, but as I said, the fundamental principle is you just wrap your solver, whatever solver you're using, uh, you wrap that in two hooks basically, one that says start doing LMS here and another that says stop doing LMS here, and then large model support will handle where it puts that data. Right? So large model support handles where it then takes that tensor and writes that tensor, either out to system memory or back into to your GPU memory. Okay, so uh, what's possible with large model support, right? So I'm sure you guys are wondering, well, actually, what kind of workloads is this useful for, right? How can I start to implement this? Um, so there's a few things that we've done in our labs. Uh, the first is uh, GoogleNet. We can increase max image resolution, obviously useful if you're looking to drive accuracy. Um, ResNet, a huge increase in batch size. So if you're trying to do things more quickly, reduce the time that your runs are taking, each epoch takes, then growing your batch size that can improve things. It'll also obviously have a positive impact on accuracy. Um, the same with ResNet 125, which is obviously larger images. Uh, and then this bottom one I want to spend a bit more detail on. This is um, the, the snappily named 3D unit brain MRIs. Um, is anyone familiar with BRATS? No? Yeah, we've got one Bratz fan. Cool. So uh, BRATS is uh, not a TV show. Um, it's a it's a it's a Kaggle competition, but well, it's on Kaggle now, and basically it's for 3D brain MRIs, right? And the challenge, as you might expect for Kaggle, is to build the most accurate system for classifying these different um, brain scans, these brain MRIs. Now, brain MRIs are huge file sizes, typically. They don't fit in your GPU memory. Um, in fact, I was, I was working with some guys that are doing research in this space, and the raw data of an MRI scan of a human head is 30 gigabytes, right? So if I've got 16 gig of GPU memory, suddenly I've got a problem. So already, research in this space is just dealing with dropping the resolution, right? Which is a problem, because it hurts accuracy, or dealing with fewer slices. Um, so 3D images, big data, big problem. So we can do some really cool stuff. Uh, so as I said, fairly high, fairly high memory usage requirements, right? So typically as a candidate for large model support. So if you find that you're dropping your batch size to like batch size one because you're running out of GPU memory, typically that's a candidate for large model support, right? It's somewhere large model support can help. Um, it's there's, a, there's this competition for it that I described on Kaggle, which is the, uh, the International Multimodal Brain Tumor Segmentation Challenge. Rats to its friends, um, and we thought, right, okay, we know large model support is a really interesting story and can help with these problems. We know that BRATS is a big data problem. Let's go and see what solutions there are out there, right? So we went to Kaggle and we looked at the number one solution, and we thought, okay, and then we looked at the number two solution and we thought, well, maybe not, and then we looked at the third solution and we thought, aha. Ha. This is for us. Uh, the reason for that is the third solution, uh, and you can look this up, the third solution uh, used Keras. So we thought, Fant <laughs> fantastic. Um, there's a, already a, a kernel written for us uh, using Keras, so all we need to do is plug in large model support and we should be good to go, right? So we had to swap the back end out so it wasn't using the TensorFlow back end. They didn't know the error of their ways. So we swapped the back end out um, and then activated large model support using those couple of lines of code that I showed beforehand. Uh, and the results were, I think, frankly, amazing. So this is the results of rerunning that algorithm. Now, the gray box here is, um, so these are dice coefficients, right? In medical imaging, dice coefficients are used to represent the accuracy of your model. They're quite a common metric. Uh, for those of you that haven't used dice coefficients, think of them as like a sideways bar chart. It's probably the easiest way to represent it, uh, where the middle is your, um, your mean, and then you've got your range represented by those horizontal bars, right? So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, now, the gray box, the gray box on this chart is the standard model. So we haven't changed image resolution. So this is running at like 0.5 image resolution for back, um, for brats. And if you can see over here on the, um, the, the far kind of right hand side of this chart, um, the accuracy is around 40%. And in some, in, if you look in the other two, it gets worse, right? It goes to like 30%, slightly worse than that. And this was the third best solution on Kaggle, right? Using that 
reduced image resolution because that's all they could do because they had to drop things because of the GPU memory limits. Now the blue box, the blue box is what happens if you use the high res images that are included as part of Bratz. So we've not dropped the resolution, we're running at 2.5x the resolution of the original Kaggle model and you can see the difference, right? It's dramatic in that we've shot up from 30-40 odd percent to up near 80 average. Right? So you've had this seismic shift in accuracy, not by rewriting all of your code, not by changing the underlying neural network you were using, or even rewriting any of that, but just by using large model support and increasing the resolution of your input data, right? Because you're then having a huge number more features and your algorithm can make smarter decisions, right? You're training essentially on more data, which you're getting for free, and you're solving a problem that you couldn't solve anywhere else. So it really does let you solve these kind of challenges that you couldn't elsewhere. Now, I need to hold my hands up and be honest, and, and that is, there is a, it's not all free, right? Everything that I've described, it sounds great, right? If you're running into this GPU memory limit, this is fantastic. Um, there is a problem, uh, and that problem is that swapping makes everything slow. So even though uh, we can do things really quickly and move stuff out to system memory all the time, and we can work with two and a half times the resolution, five times the batch size, uh, it does make things slow. Right, so there is a trade-off, and I want to go into a bit more detail about that. Like completely hands up, honestly, I want to go into a bit more detail and cover what those nuances are, and actually how you can use that to see if this technology could help you. So this is our typical GPU connectivity. Right, so this is the typical environment that we'll connect to GPUs over. Uh, in the middle, we have our x86 derivative GPU, uh, which is connected out to system memory over um, uh, 80 gig link uh, and then we have these uh, nvidia gpus the v100 gpus and they're typically connected over well they are connected over pcie now they can be connected in one of two ways either direct attached or via some kind of pcie switch things get even worse if you're using a pcie switch and i've got some numbers behind that in a minute but assuming you're not right assuming you've just gone direct attached to the gpus this is your typical architecture now if you were to try and use large model support in this environment Right? You'd notice that actually your training time pretty much like went on forever. Right? Each epoch is going like, to grind to a halt and you're going to wonder what's going on. And the reason for that is that swap in and out of memory is happening over the PCIe bus at 32 gig. Right? So even though my GPUs can talk to each other at like 80 gig over NVLink, um, suddenly everything slows down when my CPU does that swap in, swap out phase. Right? Remember it's going to do that at every layer of my network. Okay, so that's a huge penalty. So, so how do I get around that? Well, as I said, right back at the top, through that open innovation, through opening our power architecture and collaborating with NVIDIA, we were able to do this. So we took their NVLink technology and we said, why don't we put it on our processor? Right? And it lets our processor do this. It lets us direct attach to either four or six V100 GPUs. Right, over that 150 gig NVLink 2 connection. And that alleviates that bottleneck, right? It alleviates that slow swap in, swap out phase. And this is completely unique to the power architecture, right? The ability to do this is just because we've opened our processor architecture and we're collaborating with NVIDIA. And it's this that enables us to do uh, large model support. The other thing that you'll notice on this is our system memory bus is uh, more than twice as high. Um, but also, this is not the maximum, for people that have been around PAL for a while, this is not our maximum um, memory bus. We can actually go higher than that, but we've deliberately gone for 170 gig. Um, there's a reason for that. One, there is a limited amount of space on a processor. So when you sit there designing your processor, there is kind of a limited amount of room that you can squash stuff into. Tricky. The other thing is, we've tried to create a one-to-one -one ratio between the system memory bus and NVLink, right? Because otherwise, all we do is move the bottleneck one stage further out, where the CPU is then waiting for the GPUs to catch up, right? And we didn't want to do that, so we wanted to keep it as flat as possible in one direction. So it means that you can drive your data set from system memory through the Power9 CPU out to the V100 GPUs at that same kind of bandwidth. You don't have to worry about there being an induced bottleneck there. And that lets you kind of rethink your paradigm, rethink how you're designing these things, and actually not worry about this, fundamentally, is what we're trying to do. We're trying to enable it so you don't have to worry about this because we've done all that for you. So, 
what does this look like, right? When I'm doing my, when I'm running an Epic on Brat, what does it look like? Uh, so this is the NVIDIA profile of you. Fairly sure you guys are familiar with this, right? Uh, we've got the PCIe utilization represented by those gold bars, and this red bit here represents my GPU utilization, right? So when my GPU is busy. Now, this one here, this six and a bit second epic, is one image at um, on uh, an x86 derivative system, right? You pick that up, you run it on Power 9 using large model support, it looks like this. So you can see that this is already faster. These are relative, by the way, I spent ages measuring them, so please appreciate that. Um, so, so this is like 2.4 seconds um, down here, and this is the single GPU training for one image, right? But we're using large model support in the bottom one. And the thing that I think is really interesting about this is uh, essentially, and I know we kind of don't have to do this anymore, but it's like we defragged the top one, right? If anyone remembers hard drive defragmentation, right? So, so this is where we are. Um, is the GPU chunks are the same blocks, right? The GPU is doing the same work. It's just not waiting anymore. Right? We're just getting the data there faster. So when you're working with complex problems or larger data sets, we're driving that data to the GPUs much, much faster. Uh, and that's why we're doing things in two and a bit seconds rather than six and a bit. So when you've got a huge amount of data to go through and you're trying to solve for these problems and build algorithms for this, this is what enables you to do it much, much faster or at a much, much bigger scale. So. Um, the effects on epic times, uh, these three bars, so we've got AC92, which is our Power 9 based GPU system. Um, so we've got AC92 over there and it's 500 seconds or something like that for a whole epic. Uh, in the middle we've got our uh, GPU server, our x86 based GPU server with PCIe, so it's PCIe connected, and on the far side that is um, with PCIe contention. Right, so it's more than one GPU connected through a PCIe switch, basically, which is common in some server architectures because it frees up PCIe lanes. Uh, anyway, so we've got these three different uh, architectures here, uh, and as you can see, the epics are much faster on, on the P9-based system because of that NVLink technology, right? because of that direct connection to the GPUs over NVLink. Uh, it also drives up uh, GPU utilization. So here we can see, so these are the same three representations, Power 9, x86, x86 with a switch. Uh, you can see that we are driving GPU utilization right up, right? So typically what happens is your GPU sits there waiting for data from system memory, right? To be copied over from that processor. We're driving that through the roof. We can work our GPUs harder, we can work them for longer, and ultimately build more accurate models. Um, and then obviously you can see that threshold. So this is the overhead, important to consider when you're looking at whether or not this technology would be useful to you and the workload you're running, uh, is that we've got, there is an overhead through doing this, it's not completely free. So again, we're going through, this is just increasing the uh, batch size, so this is increasing the image resolution um, for the 16 and 32 gig GPUs. So as you can see, we um, actually get a slightly larger overhead, although relatively smaller overhead on the 16 gig GPUs, because we're copying smaller chunks of data over, so it benefits more from large model support. But there is an overhead, right? So if your training is not taking you a long time, if your model isn't large, then it doesn't necessarily benefit from this. And I've seen customers take this technology and try and build stuff with it and I've, um, I've worked on projects where actually we're not dealing with you know large volumes of data or complex images or, or complex problem spaces to map and actually it suffers through doing this, things get slower uh, because there's typically a, a warm up time and also we now have to wait to copy stuff in and out. So you have to have that trade off between well I know that each epoch is taking me longer than the overhead will give me back. And if it does give me that back, then I know I can do more complicated, bigger things. So it's just something to, to bear in mind. Okay, so uh, where next for large model support, right? Where are we taking this? Uh, as I said earlier on, it's in, um, it sits in TensorFlow Contrib at the moment, which we all know is being sunset from TensorFlow um, 2.0. So we're looking at where to put it. Right, so um, Grappler seems like a sensible place to put it because of the way Grappler operates. Uh, it's kind of similar in nature to large model support. Um, so we're kind of looking at, at where to, to house it. Um, it's not just for TensorFlow as well, although it feels like swearing to say that at this meetup of all meetups, but there is also an equivalent runtime for PyTorch and CAFE. So if you're doing stuff in those languages as well, we've got the same 
um, the same hooks, the same runtime, looks the same to implement, uh, but in those frameworks too. So um, this is kind of where we are today and, and looking forward into the next step. The other thing which might be of interest to people in the room is that this is completely open source. We're not doing this ourselves large. Um, we, uh, we presented at uh, the, the TensorFlow developer conference. We presented the work we'd done in our model support and the TensorFlow guy said, we think this looks really, really cool. Can we have it? And we said, yeah, of course you can. So we open sourced it. Um, so you can go, in fact, I've got a link at the end of this to the pull request that's active in TensorFlow where you can go and get this code if you want it uh, and see how we've implemented it and, and comment on it. Um, and I'm sure there'll all be friendly comments because I know the internet very well. So, um, so that's large model support, right? And that's where we are with our systems. Uh, fundamentally, just to wrap up, um, tensor swapping, you can use that to overcome the fact that at the moment you're memory constrained, you're GPU memory constrained, right? And that lets you look at running deeper models, so more complex simulations. I've got loads of stories I can tell you about the stuff that we're doing there. High resolution images, if that's your problem, if you're constrained by image sizes, or larger batch sizes. So to do things more quickly and drive accuracy through increasing your batch size. And all of this is enabled by that NV Link 2 connection between our CPU and our GPU. Uh, so that was an absolute whistle-stop tour of uh, large model support. Um, thank you very much for listening. You guys have been great. Uh, down here, as I promised, that's the link to the pull request where you can go and look at the code, what we've written for TensorFlow. Below that is our scholarly article. So we've actually written a white paper on large model support and how it can help in this space and how it can help with large image data. Uh, and below that, um, we have a, a use case which is really interesting, which is to do with kind of um, autonomous driving type stuff. So worth checking out. And as I said, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to me um, on social media. Thank you very much.